Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Kevin McKernan. I've done a lot of work in the genomics field. Um, this is a follow-up to a previous episode of, of this uh, presentation on the genetics of, uh, of coronaviruses. Um, so if you haven't seen the April 10th video, please do. Uh, in that video, we looked at the genetics of, of SARS-CoV-2 and noticed that uh, people have published that there's a 40 to 70 year gap from the most previous known ancestor known as rat G13. 40 to 70 years is a long time. Uh, we need to know what happened in that time frame. If there are other SARS coronaviruses that existed in the human population prior to December, those coronaviruses could be offering up uh, immune response in the human population to the existing one. And that's what we were hypothesizing, but we had no data at the time to really prove it. We just had a feeling that all viruses have ancestors unless they're made in the lab, and ancestors um, that, particularly if they're asymptomatic, travel very quickly through populations and build up immunity in the population. So do we have any immunity in the population currently from prior coronaviruses that may be giving immunity to this one? If we do, then the transmission rate of this virus to the population is not going to follow R0. It's going to follow uh, a different equation that people use known as RE. We're going to end up having a, suscept a non-susceptible population that can't get this, and that's going to attenuate the exponential in, in, in the growth of this. This might be what's happening in the field. We're going to show you some data that may support this. It's still an open debate. Um, this picture here is somewhat emblematic of this. We have a very divided sky here, which is div divided in that there are people who are pro-lockdown and people who are anti-lockdown. Their heels are dug in and no one's agreeing. I want people to back up and just look at the data, all right? Uh, this is an important um, uh, detail, and let's see what the data says. Um, okay, so before we get started, um, one thing uh, to keep in mind is that, uh, as we mentioned before, coronaviruses circulate very, very frequently in the population. The common cold is a coronavirus. We have these every year. They're very seasonal. They come and they go. They affect different parts of the population differently. We do have some other data that's now emerging from a variety of petri dishes, if you will. Uh, we have cases where populations are incredibly contained, um, the Diamond Princess being one of them, uh, we have also aircraft carrier, the USS Roosevelt, where everybody was tightly contained. And there is some assumption going on here that if they're tightly contained, or at least as contained as anybody can contain human beings, like prisons, uh, that everybody should eventually get it if those HVAC systems are circulating the same air. And this is truly something that's respiratory. Now, it is possible in all of these studies that the people in the Diamond Princess and the aircraft carrier in the prisons reacted with some level of quarantine and interventions. I, I really don't know what those would look like in prisons or in tight aircraft carriers, but it's possible that some of those interventions prevented some of the pe people on those, on those, um, in those environments from getting disease. But I've, I highly doubt this. I'm very suspect that uh, you can take tight environments like that and actually maintain this virus, yet we still see it spreading through wide, uh, you know, open populations right now. All right, so in the Diamond Princess, there's about 80% of the people that never got it. In the airport carrier, there's around 82% um, that never got it. Uh, in the prisons, there's a very high percentage of asymptomatic people. Uh, there's a great place called the Marshall Project that I encourage people to see where they're tracking the cases in the prisons, okay? This is probably a, a very, um, I'd say, worst case scenario in that the prison population is probably vitamin D deficient. They don't get outside much. I don't think that's an environment that's really conducive to healthy immune systems, uh, and so, What's going on in the prisons is probably very emblematic of what might happen, or it's probably a worst case scenario of what might happen in the real world because people aren't really locked down like they are in prisons where you have high contact with other individuals, you have shared food services, you have a really uh, challenging time uh, to maintain distances in many of these circumstances, okay? So large parts of the population are not showing symptoms when, this, when they're forced to be in presence of this disease. Um, so this is somewhat of a hint why aren't these people getting it? Should we be using the term novel? It's definitely novel from an RNA sequencing standpoint, but does not necessarily mean that it's novel from an epitope standpoint. And that's what some of these papers that have emerged since we put this hypothesis forward are beginning to hint at. Here's probably the most important one. This is a paper from Cell. Cell's a very respected journal. Uh, what you see here is a case where they are looking at C4 in CD8 cells uh, to see if there is any immune response from these cells to SARS-CoV-2 from patients that have never been exposed before. Now, this is a 100-person study, um, and they're measuring uh, the reactivity of these things, and you can see they come to the conclusion 
that 40 to 60 percent of unexposed individuals suggesting cross-reactive T-cell recognition between circulating common cold viruses and SARS-CoV-2, okay? So if, if common cold viruses can elicit immune response against SARS-CoV-2, the exponential models that we have in place assuming the immunonaive population are flat wrong. They are not anticipating there to be any level of immunity to this. And so they're overestimating the magnitude and the extent that this disease might spread. Now, I, I try not to emphasize um, preprints, but right now we are in a world of preprints with how fast this is moving. And when preprints come out that support peer-reviewed papers, that strengthens both of them. So here's another preprint. Expected immune recognition of COVID-19 virus by memory from earlier infections with common coronaviruses in a large part of the world population. Now, these are in silica, uh, and uh, they are talking about some of these other coronaviruses, and I will caution these other coronaviruses like OC43, HKU1, 229E, and NL63 are very distant. They're more distant to SARS-CoV-2 than RATG13, and their spike proteins do not share a tremendous amount of homology. However, there are probably other coronaviruses between these and SARS-CoV-2 that exist in the population as well that we just haven't surveyed yet. They're, if they're asymptomatic patients, we tend to not sequence them. And so I wouldn't be surprised if other cold viruses have swung through that are closer to SARS-CoV-2 that are conferring this actual effect. So what do they say here? They say that these common human viruses are expected to induce immune memory against SARS-CoV-2 by sharing protein fragments, antigen epitopes. We spoke on this at the, about the April 10th video for, for presentations to the immune system, MHC class one. A list of such epitopes is provided. The number of these epitopes and the prevalence of the common coronaviruses suggest that a large part of the world population has some degree of specific immunity against SARS-CoV-2 already even without having been infected by the virus, all right? This is what we were hinting at in the previous video. Now, I wanna be very clear here that current antibody tests are under a lot of attack because they, when they first came out, they had very high false negatives and high false positive rates. And while those can be useful when there's a high population frequency of the disease, when there's a low population frequency of the disease, it can be hard to discern the false positives or the false negatives with, uh, with the actual real positives that are the true positives that are in the population. Let's say you have a 5% false negative rate, um, or, or let's say even a 5% false positive rate, which means 5% of the time you call the patients infected when they in fact are not. That gets really messy if there's a 5% frequency of the pop, of the disease in the population. Now you got a you got a coin toss as to whether it's in fact a false positive or whether it's real. When it gets to 50% of the population, uh, you, you have a much wider separation there. Now, as someone who has designed antibody tests before and designed qPCR tests before, the one thing that's really important is for you to understand how they validate these tests. They tend to find a population that is assumed to be SARS-CoV-2 negative, and they do that temporarily. They end up picking up um, patients or blood samples or serum that are prior to December. December is when we thought this thing whole started. I'm a little suspect that, that we actually picked the first case because many of the cases that were found in Wuhan never went to the wet market and so they got it from somewhere else and we don't know where. So I do not think we have the exact first person or the zoonotic event in December. I think we're gonna find over time that we'll find some more ancestors, but nevertheless, even if you go back a couple years and assume that the people from many years ago couldn't have had SARS-CoV-2, that those are the true negatives, and you design antibody tests to not pick up the negatives, but do pick up the positives, you're making very, very specific antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. That's very helpful and the right thing to do if you're tracking SARS-CoV-2 and you want to know the prevalence of that exact uh, virus. However, as these papers are showing, that might shoot ourselves in the foot because it's not giving us a measure of who's immune. Because if you can get immunity from prior coronaviruses and your antibody tests are specifically designed not to react to those prior coronaviruses, you are going to underestimate the immunity in the population. That's what these papers are speaking to, is that we probably need a set of antibody tests that are much broader, that pick up the ancestral coronaviruses that might confer immunity to SARS-CoV-2. So while the CDC and others are arguing that we don't have the specificity we need, they're correct in that we don't have the specificity we necessarily want to track SARS-CoV-2, but that's not the goal. That's one goal. The other goal is to know who might be immune so they can go back to work. And when you do that, you need to start looking at the other coronaviruses because you may have gotten one of those. In fact, some of these papers you're gonna see 
are suggesting that this might be the reason why the children aren't getting the disease. The children are probably seeing a really high flux of coronaviruses and cold viruses, much more so than the, the elderly population that's more sedentary. They may not be seeing these things and not be building immunity, and then SARS-CoV-2 comes through and wipes them out. The kids, on the other hand, are getting them all, and they're building immunity. And so they may be um, more immune and more able to cope with this uh, than someone who has been absent of uh, the, the viral pool, if you will, because they're very sedentary and they're not meeting a lot of people, not shaking a lot of hands, and their contact map is exponentially lower. Those people, when they get a, a, a more virulent strain like this and they haven't conferred any resistance from a more benign strain that may protect them against this, they really get hit hard. All right. So that's what we think may be going on, and some of these papers are beginning to confirm this. Here's another preprint. Um, however, uh, you know, I want to emphasize it's a preprint, but it's a preprint that tends to mirror what peer-reviewed papers are saying, so they both kind of build on each other. This one is suggesting pre-existing and de novo humoral, humoral immunity to SARS-CoV-2 in humans. HCOV. HCOV is another uh, human coronavirus that is a cold virus. This H HCOV patient sera also variably reacted with SARS-CoV-2, <laughs> S, a nucleocapsid protein, but with S1 subunit or the receptor binding domain of an S of S on the standard enzyme amino assay. Amino assays are like ELISA assays. These are things that test for antibodies. Notably, HCOV patient sera exhibited specific neutralizing activity against SARS-CoV-2 pseudotypes according to levels of SARS-CoV-2 S binding IgG and with efficiencies comparable to those of COVID-19 patient sera. So historical patient sera is exhibiting neutralizing activity against SARS-CoV-2. Third paper, all right, that's showing this. There's more. Uh, I can dig up a few more of these. Um, here's one that's a little mixed on the topic, but it also is, is uh, getting back to these same points, uh, that uh, it's conceivable that children and infants have primed mucosal innate and IgA antibody responses due to their frequent upper respiratory tract infections. Therefore, respond preferentially in this manner to SARS-CoV-2 infection. This hypothesis might also explain why children rarely present with symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. Okay. Um, now, this paper also pointed out that some of those other historical coronaviruses that we've documented don't share very similar spike proteins. And, and uh, but but that's 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 an important point. But there may be ones we haven't measured that are more closely related to SARS-CoV-2 that do. Um, and in fact, if you look at these particular um, ancestral coronaviruses, the ones that are spoken about here, they're, they're actually less related to the current virus than, than RAT G13. But they're important to study. Uh, and in some cases, they're, they're, even those are providing immunity. So um, this is getting more interesting. As, uh, as the antibody tests roll out, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a much higher prevalence than we ever anticipated. That's certainly what we were predicting from the phylogenetics of this, that the antibody tests would come back and be high, and they're higher than we, even we anticipated. So that's, a good, that's good news. More people have this, and, and not as many people are actually... Uh, that, that means the fatality rate is actually lower because the denominator is much bigger. There's more people that have seen this. That's good news. But there's even better news, which is that prior cold viruses, which aren't being picked up, I should say that in air quotes because there's a lot of different antibody tests out there and I don't presume to know what they all pick up, but it, I have designed these tests and you need to run exclusion criteria on these tests and demonstrate that they don't hit MERS and they don't hit SARS-1. And when you do that, you're enriching for antibodies that are very specific to SARS-CoV-2 and they probably don't pick up these ancestral cold viruses. Um, okay, so there's also an interesting seroconversion paper in healthcare workers, uh, which is uh, another you know, piece of the puzzle. Here they're showing prior symptomatic illness generated quantitatively higher antibody responses than asymptomatic seroconversion. Seroconversion rates were highest among those workers in housekeeping, acute medicine, general internal medicine, and lower rates observed in participants working intensive care and emergency medicine. So if you got a disease that felt or matched the symptoms of SARS-CoV-2, but it was before December and therefore everyone has been shouting at you that it couldn't have been SARS-CoV-2, it may not have been SARS-CoV-2. It may have been one of its ancestors. And those ancestors seem to give you better antibody response, okay? They're saying if you had prior symptomatic illness like this that wasn't SARS-CoV-2, you may have get higher antibody response to SARS-CoV-2. So again, your history of the immune repertoire here is, uh, is like a workout for your immune system getting ready for this one, all right? So, you know, people who may have had, uh, you know, symptoms like this back in October and November may have fared better if they actually got SARS, all right? 
Now, there's some other data um, on this that I'm going to touch on from pangolins. The pangolin data was really interesting. This kind of put a couple bullets in the lab-derived hypothesis, at least. Um, at least in my opinion, it did. Because uh, when you look at the, um, the pangolin data, uh, they're starting to find that um, there's a lot more of these viruses in pangolins. And that in fact, the, the uh, S protein region of it is really similar to SARS-CoV-2. And some of these pangolins are actually getting symptoms. Um, that's really interesting because most reservoirs are assumed to be non-symptomatic, and, and if this is a reservoir that's symptomatic, that's kind of that's kind of cool. Um, so I encourage you to look at this paper because it shows you that these things do exist, and if they do exist with very high homology to the spike protein, well, then we don't necessarily need a lab-derived hypothesis for this to exist. Nature was capable of making this on its own. This doesn't rule out that it could have been made in the lab. But it certainly presents an Occam's razor that if nature can make these things on its own, that's probably where it came from. Um, yes, there is the technology to make these things in the laboratory. That is completely possible. I've not seen convinced evidence that that's exclusively where it could have come from. And there's plenty of evidence of Mother Nature making these viruses very, uh, very well without any of our help. Okay, so uh, if it's not derived from a lab, it has to have ancestors, all right? If it has ancestors, those ancestors if they've gone unnoticed, are likely asymptomatic because we tend to not sequence things that are asymptomatic. So we may have had lots of asymptomatic SARS-like viruses running around the population, priming our immune system for this puppy, and that would explain why the models are falling short of the morbidity. Uh, they're falling a lot short of the morbidity. Now, so here's another pangolin data uh, paper that's really cool. I encourage people to read it. Um, and this is the one pointing out that the respect receptor binding domain with the S protein of the pangolin is virtually identical to what's floating around now. So those papers that were suggesting this S protein was so special that it had to be human made are kind of deflated a little bit by this paper. This paper kind of shows that mother nature is quite capable of making these things all on its own. But I also want to point you to the fact that they're demonstrating that some of these symptomatic pangolins have an antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 like viruses. So they use some antibody tests that are used to measure SARS-CoV-2, and notice they popped hot on these pangolins. And it's not the same virus, but it's close. Once again, another example that since these things share epitopes, other viruses can, in fact, give us immunity to this one. So the term novel is, I think, a little bit of an abused term in the news that's trying to conjure up a lot of fear. Now, we've also had a lot more information on this puppy, okay? And I say puppy because it's now found in dogs. And now, it looks like it got there from humans, but it does make you think, if we've seen this in rats, pangolins, cats, ferrets, minks, and dogs, uh, we probably need to look in some other places. It might be in pigs. A lot of pigs were coming down with some viruses in China. Uh, that's uh, that, that, more likely that they're eating that than they're eating bats. Um, whales and marine mammals have very similar ACE2 receptors, and a lot of those things end up in wet markets, even though they shouldn't. Um, you, you just look at the movie The Cove. There's a lot of people that actually eat uh, dolphins. So um, horrible story, but it, it does happen in some of those wet markets. So that could be another source, complete conjecture. But uh, if it's this promiscuous, you have to stop and ask, did this jump to humans in December and suddenly achieve zoonotic plasticity that can go everywhere? Or have these been bouncing around throughout time between all the different mammals? I, I'm, I'm, I, I suspect it's the latter. I don't have evidence for it, other than the fact that now that it's in humans, it seems to be going everywhere else. Uh, I am somewhat skeptical that lightning struck in December and made a virus that suddenly is this promiscuous. I suspect its ancestors were fairly promiscuous, but were not, did not present symptoms that caught our attention to make us go look for more of it. I think these things are um, happy to move to many different mammals that have ACE2 receptors, uh, and they've been doing so back and forth for probably for quite some time. But that's just my personal belief. Um, we need more data to really confirm that. Uh, I'm, I'm just very suspect of someone winning the lottery and having sequenced the, you know, the first person that they ever sequenced in Wuhan happened to be the zoonotic event. I think that is uh, uh, unbelievable. Um, there's some other resources I would encourage people to look at uh, here. There is some great work from Michael Levitt, who has been demonstrating that this is not following an exponential curve, and there is something putting the brakes in the spread of this, and he's very suspect that it's the lockdowns. I'm also suspect that it's the lockdowns. I've seen a lot of those lockdowns occur too late for this to matter. The reason for that is we usually invoke the lockdowns when we see the, um, uh, the nursing homes start to have high fatality. Well, when the nursing homes have, uh, have uh, you know, high fatality, the cat's out of the bag. That's the part of the population that gets the disease last um, as they're the least, um, they're the most sedentary. Uh, what, the people who tend to spread this are, are asymptomatic people who have high exponential contact maps, people that are up healthy, 
don't seem to have symptoms, don't have any reason to lock themselves down, and are mingling and moving around before there's a lot of um, fear of the spread. And then when we start to see the mortality you know, come up in the elderly population, put the brakes on, it's too late. Uh, in fact, removing these breaks doesn't seem to be expanding the number of, of mortality either, which is another sign that the lockdowns are, uh, are really just for show. Uh, and uh, I don't think they're actually having a, a severe impact on the progression of this disease. What I think is having a severe impact on the, in the, on the progression of this disease is the fact that we didn't anticipate these antibodies to give us any immunity. And there's a large number of people out there that are asymptomatic um, that are not coming down with the disease, probably due to this uh, prior uh, exposure. Uh, there's a, a few other podcasts here I turn you to. They'll give you some other perspectives. I think they're, um, Sunetra Gupta has some really interesting points to say here. encourage you to, to look at that. Um, also, the basic reproduction number here. Uh, this is good to know. We have had r naught in the media nonstop, but that r naught assumes an immuno-naive population, and we now know we don't have one. Uh, so we should not be using r naught anymore. We should be discounting r naught uh, with metrics that capture the fact that there's a certain percentage of the population that may have antibodies to this uh, that are not just SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, but may um, actually have antibodies from prior coronaviruses that may be playing a role. Uh, that's very important to know. And a couple other, I uh, put one other um, article down here that I found of interest as well throughout all this. I hope these are helpful. Uh, please, if you have any questions, put them in the comment section. I'm happy to try and answer those as they come through. But um, my general guess right now is that this virus is on its way out and whoever's making vaccines i wish you well but i don't think you're going to have a population to put them upon uh, by the time you get them to market it's probably going to be handled with um, drugs that can be taken off label that are already through the fda that are only applied to the ever diminishing number of people that are in fact symptomatic uh, this could be very good news i hope it's the case and i confess to perhaps having some uh, bias of optimism here because I do think it is sorely needed. Uh, thank you.